Hello, I'm Hunter Hansfield, Professor Emeritus of Medicine at the University of Washington Center for AIDS and STD, and for many years the Director of the Sexually Transmitted Diseases Control Program for Public Health Seattle and King County. Well, there are two kinds of testing for HSV, the uh, antibody tests uh, and the test the body's immune response to the virus and direct tests for the virus. Of the direct tests to detect the virus in a genital lesion, uh, there's either culture, which actually collects a specimen and attempts to grow the virus in the laboratory, and DNA testing, also known as nucleic acid amplification testing or NAAT. The most common NAT test is, uh, is a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction. The, NAT, the DNA tests in general are more accurate, that is they'll pick up more infections than culture. Culture can easily miss an infection, especially if a lesion is uh, starting to heal. So the DNA tests are preferred as the direct test from a lesion, but culture is pretty good if that's what your local lab uh, offers. Increasingly, PCR is becoming the not only a test of choice, but the most frequently test done. Most frequently, most test done most frequently in the US. So a positive culture or DNA test is 100%. I mean, assuming a gross error such as mixing up with someone else's specimen didn't occur. Uh, so you can rely on it. Uh, the important thing is, however, that sometimes labs will stop at just determining whether herpes simplex virus is present or not without determining what type it is. These tests, both culture and DNA testing, can easily determine virus type, and it's very important to know the virus type since the natural course and need for treatment for genital HSV1 versus HSV2 uh, are different. So be sure that if a test is done, that your doctor requests and the lab does the further test to determine virus type. So HSV-1 and HSV-2 are actually quite different when they affect the genital area. Uh, HSV-1 is the dominant cause of oral herpes, but can be transmitted to the genitals, especially by uh, oral sex. Uh, of all new cases of genital herpes in the U.S. and Western Europe at the present time, about half are due to HSV-1. That's a major increase in the last couple of decades and reflects the increasing frequency of oral sex uh, in, in couples uh, in uh, in. Western countries. Um, however, if you're unlucky enough to get genital herpes, but lucky enough to have it HSV-1, you're going to have a much lesser likelihood of recurrent outbreaks. So the average frequency of outbreaks of genital HSV-1 after the initial one is low. 40% of people have no recurrent outbreaks at all at least not in the next year or two, and most of the remainder have one or two outbreaks over the next two or three years, and then often none after that. HSV-2, by contrast, recurs in those who have symptoms about uh, anywhere from three to 10 times a year, averaging four or five times a year, that is every couple of months. So it's a very different, and there's also a much higher frequency of asymptomatic shedding of the virus in HSV-2 than HSV-1, so sexual transmission in the absence of symptoms is far more likely with HSV-2 than HSV-1. So for those reasons, it's really important to know virus type, and if you have HSV-2 as opposed to HSV-1, you're much more likely to benefit from ongoing suppressive antiviral therapy, both to prevent recurrent outbreaks and to help prevent transmission to partners. Most people with genital HSV-1 probably don't require suppressive therapy. Because of that difference in recurrence out, recurrent outbreaks, even though half of all new genital herpes is HSV-1, of people with recurrent genital herpes, those who say, yeah, I've had four or five outbreaks in the last couple of years, are almost all HSV-2. So of all initial HSV, most uh, half is HSV-1, but of all recurrent HSV, over 90% is HSV-2. People with HSV of either type are generally immune, or at least quite resistant to new infections with the same type anywhere in the body. So someone who has a history of cold sores, uh, typical blister sores on the outside of the lips that occur from time to time, the classic cold sore fever blister, almost always due to HSV-1, are not going to catch HSV-1 of the genitals or anywhere else in the body, uh, with extremely rare uh, exceptions. Similarly, if someone already has genital HSV-2, 
uh, they're not going to get a new HSV2 infection if exposed. So for that reason, people don't ping pong their infections back and forth. So a couple that's mutually infected with the same virus really need not take any precautions at all against transmission, with the obvious thing that for comfort, if you've got open, painful lesion, you're probably gonna to wanna to avoid sex at those times. There are exceptions to this, and recent research has shown that new infections with the same HSV type may occur a bit more frequently than was once thought, but it's still the exception and, uh, and not the rule. Condoms are a bit, uh, in a way, controversial. Uh, and when you think about condoms, I would urge people to think of the difference between biological effectiveness and what is called use effectiveness. So biological effectiveness is during any single exposure in a properly used condom that properly covers the, the, the uh, potentially exposed and infected areas. What's the likelihood of transmission in that situation? And for herpes, that's probably typically at least 60, 70, 80 percent, maybe 90 percent plus. There still can be exposure above the, the condom range. Use effectiveness is how well does it work in the real world. So in someone who relies solely on condoms to prevent transmitting herpes, and when condoms sometimes are not used properly, or sometimes break, or sometimes slip, uh, or if there is an asymptomatic or overt outbreak involving the skin above where the condom hits, the use effectiveness of condoms to prevent herpes is probably around 50%. That is a couple in which one has infected, one is infected and the other isn't, who relies only on condoms probably will reduce the chance of transmission by about half, but not much more than that over time. So uh, somewhere between 50 and 90%, depending on whether you're talking about single careful use versus average use uh, over time for condoms. Um, valacyclovir, which is the only anti-HSV drug that's actually been studied to prevent transmission. Acyclovir and famcyclovir may work as well, but can't be as 100% certain. Uh, reduces the overall risk of transmission by about 50% over time in couples in which one person's infected and the other one isn't. Um, there are some reasons to believe that that's a low estimate, that the design of the single research study that came up with that result uh, was designed in such a way that it might have minimized the actual protection. In my experience, I would have said the real protection is probably 70%. It's nowhere near perfect. The two together, or the three strategies together, of avoiding sex when overt outbreaks are present, and using condoms consistently, and taking valacyclovir, probably is extremely good. I think many couples in that situation can go through a relationship of years, and transmission never occur. The risk is never zero, but uh, but it can be largely minimized. And some couples, depending on the situation, may choose one of those, and not necessarily uh, all of those uh, uh, particular strategies. Uh, I would say that the other thing for couples in this situation to remember is that this research shows the single greatest fear that generates concern about herpes, am I going to get it and what happens if I have it, is the fear of transmission to partners and particularly of discussing their herpes as they form new relationships in a world where whether we like it or not, and whether you can argue about the social consequences thereof, sexual intimacy or, or, or sex tends to precede personal intimacy as new relationships develop. And in that context, disclosing herpes ahead of time can be pretty darn stressful. Well, that, that issue is no longer on the table for a committed monogamous couple. So the committed monogamous couple that sees their relationship going indefinitely into the future the transmission to new partners issue isn't a concern. And so in that situation, many couples let, say, let, let the chips fall where they may. They don't worry too much about transmission, knowing that if it occurs, they'll be on the alert and aware of it. They know they can start antiviral therapy immediately to limit the severity of the first outbreak. And that after that, you know, there's a big silver lining about herpes. It is so mild for most people that half of all infected people don't even know they've got it. And of the rest, you can typically control the disease with antiviral therapy 
and if transmission isn't a concern to new patients. So herpes has a tremendous psychosocial overlay, but knowledge about it and understanding about how well it can be managed can reduce that. And most, I'm not telling anybody to look forward to having genital herpes, but if it happens, it is generally not the end of the world. And it can be managed with the result of a normal life and normal sex, sexuality, romance, and love uh, without the impact that people are afraid of when they haven't yet got the disease. Thank you.